Hello, it's the Product Highs Podcast. My name is Brian Castle. Thanks for tuning in. Today, we're talking to my friend Mike Tabor, who I'm sure many of you probably know from Startups for the Rest of Us fame, the popular podcast that he co hosts with Rob Walling. Mike has uh, had quite a journey these past few years and through his career. We really touched on a lot of it. So even if you're a fan of Mike's or his podcast, you've met him at, at microconfs that he helps organize, I think you're going to learn a thing or two about his uh, backstory and hear some of the ins and outs of how things started, um, the early days of him working with, with Rob and the Micropreneur Academy and the Starters for the Rest of Us podcast. We touched on that, how that grew over the years. Then we uh, we went into uh, just a bit of his work in Audit Shark, and then now into, of course, the launch of his current company, bluetick.io, which is all about doing sales follow-up from your email with some fancy automation built in. I'll let Mike explain it in a much better way than I could. (laughs) But yeah, just always great catching up with Mike. And it was really interesting to hear how he took lessons learned from previous steps along his journey and really put them to use to see real results in the past year in terms of traction, validating a new product, getting paying customers, and really just moving the ball forward at a much faster clip. So here it is. Here's my interview with Mike Tabor. Enjoy. Okay, I'm here with Mike Tabor. Mike, how's it going? It's great. How are you doing? Doing good. Uh, yeah, so you and I have known each other for several years now. We've we've hit the slopes in Vermont a few times at Big Snow Tiny Comp. I did it with my head, though. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, hung out with you at, of course, MicroConf, which you co-organize uh, with Rob Walling. And, but right now, in 2017, you are in the midst of the launch of Blue Tick, which is, uh, which is pretty exciting. And it's just been really exciting for me, you know, tuning in to, to you and the progress this year to see that really gain so much traction and, and make so much progress in a pretty short amount of time. Um, so that's just been really exciting. So first, I want to hear from you about like Blue Tick and what it is and where you are in that launch sequence right now. And then after that, we'll, we'll kind of go back and, and get more of the backstory. Sure. So yeah, what is Blue Tick? So Blue Tick is uh, designed for doing warm or cold follow-up sequences. And the intent is to be able to get a response from somebody if you send them an email. So a lot of times what you'll do is you'll send an email to somebody and you may not get a response the first time. So you have to follow up with them. And you know that, res- that follow-up may be a couple days later, maybe a week or two later. It depends on the situation. But in most cases, you need a response of some kind from the person to move forward through the sales process or whatever it is that you're trying to accomplish. Um, or you need them to do something something, for example, schedule a meeting with you. And Blue Tick essentially manages that stuff automatically for you. So, and, and it does it in the background so that you don't have to do it. So for example, it, on my website, you can sign up for a demo, um, which will probably not be there by the time this episode goes live. But at the moment, you can sign up for a demo and it will add you into an email sequence. I make a little few tweaks to an email template. And then after that, I just let it go. And it has about an 80% response rate once somebody gets into that email sequence because they're pretty well qualified. And the intent is to get them to that demo and to sign up for it. And I have all the automation behind it so that I literally do not have to be involved beyond that first email. So I just do some customizations, hit the button, and the rest of it just kind of happens in the background. Very cool. So it's kind of like, whereas something like a, like a Drip or a MailChimp or a, you know any of these like email marketing tools, that's more like marketing automation on a large scale to many thousands of people on your list. Blue tick fills that gap from your like personal email inbox to do a little bit more high touch hands-on follow-ups, but then have some automation in place so that you don't have to like actually remember to come back a few weeks later. Yeah. So those types of tools, you can think of them as like, um, you know, one to many automation with blue tick. It is one to one automation at scale. So it's really designed for that high touch, more personalized experience. And because the emails come directly from your mailbox and the replies come directly back into your mailbox, it's indistinguishable for most people to look at that and say that it was sent by a computer. And the reality is that it was for the most part. I mean, you obviously have a hand in crafting the emails. Right. But like you wrote it originally, so. Right. Well, I mean, you could say you could say the same thing about like an email that goes out to 10,000 people. But the difference is because this is coming directly out of your mailbox when the other person receives it, it looks like you personally sent it and personally took the time to send it. So it creates this illusion that you are handcrafting each and every email. And that's not necessarily the case. And in most of the cases, you really just need to kind of nudge people along to get them to respond to you because people get busy. 
Yeah. So we're going to dig, dig into that much more and especially your, your launch process, how you validated it, um, how you're rolling it out. I believe right now you're literally in the middle of like the launch event. So we're, we're going through that now. We'll, we'll dig into that. Um, I want to go back. I mean, you know, a lot of folks in my audience, uh, probably know who you are or at least listen to your podcast starters for the rest of us. So in, in this sort of case, I'd like to just hear more of your backstory, maybe hear a few things that folks aren't aware of. So I was actually listening to your podcast today, um, this week's episode, and you mentioned something. I forgot whether or not you and I talked about this, but you were born in Japan? Yeah, <laughs> I was. Uh, what's the story there? Um, so my dad was in the Air Force, and my parents got married when they were just out of high school. So my dad was like, I think, 19. My mom was 18, and they were over based overseas in Japan. And that's that ended up being where I was born. So it says, you know, born in Japan on my passport, which word to the wise, you know, public service announcement here, do not joke with the TSA guys about not looking Japanese. Right. Because <laughs> I'm clearly not. Right, right. Yeah, that was a uh, I don't think that went over real well with the TSA guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I guess we're not going to see like a president Mike Tabor anytime soon. So it's funny you mentioned that because I'm on all the government forms. Everything gets messed up because although I was born in Japan, it's considered U.S. soil because it was a military base. So it's one of those edge case exceptions where I could be president. Theoretically, I could also be the emperor of Japan. So I've got that going for me. <laughs> cool. So what age were you when like, do, like you don't remember? Was that like before you even remember or? Yeah, I mean, I we moved out of Japan and back to the U.S. when I was probably one, one and a half, something like that. So I was uh, on the verge of speaking Japanese, and I could ask for water in Japanese, and I knew a few other words, but I never became fluent because we just didn't stick around. And your your parents were in the military. Like, did you move around a lot after that, or, or did you grow up in the same place? Um, mostly in the same place. So my parents moved to Plattsburgh after that. Actually, they were in Maine for a little while and then in, in Plattsburgh, New York, uh, near Lake Champlain, Canadian border area. Um, and then after that, we moved uh, basically back to where my parents grew up. So, And then I kind of bounced around a little bit in upstate New York. But for the most part, I would say somewhere between Rochester and Syracuse, New York is kind of where I grew up. Okay. So you know, like early on, I, I'm always like kind of fascinated with the stupid question, like, what did you want to be when you grew up, right? Like, you know, as you start to get older, high school, college, like, did you ever start to expect that you would be in the sort of career that you're in now back then? Um, you know, I sort of did. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily say that I had visions of doing exactly what I am now. But at the time, uh, when I was going through high school, I actually wanted to become a, a professional video game developer. So I was reading all the books on how to build your own game engines and write code. And you know, I was very big into role-playing games back then as well. So uh, anything that came out in the Nintendo or Super Nintendo, I was always playing those types of things, especially when it came to like the role-playing games or even the action ones, which kind of crossed the line like Zelda and Final Fantasy and things like that. And it was always my dream to kind of build a game development company and run that. But over the years, it came, I came to realize that it's kind of difficult to both write code and run the business at the same time. So, I mean, like early on, were you actually thinking about starting a company or like becoming a developer and going to work for Nintendo or something like that? No, I was. Uh, so I wanted to, to have a company. Um, I mean, I've, I've started businesses since I was probably 18 or 19. So it's been like a long time, uh, like at least on the side for a long time. I probably ran my own business on the side for six or seven years before I took the leap to to go independent and run my own business like as a full time thing. So I've been I've been self employed since two thousand five, and that's just kind of the way I've run everything since then. I've like for five or six seven years before that, I ran a couple of different smaller businesses. Uh, they made some money, but nothing substantial, and it was never nearly enough to like support myself. But I didn't know enough about networking or how to get out in front of an audience or marketing or any of that stuff. I just didn't know enough at the time to be able to build a real business out of it. So I think, I mean, I'm sure I'm not alone here. Like I, I know your current business. I, I know a bit of the story about like Audit Shark and the stuff you've been doing with Rob. But like before that seems like a blur with Mike Tabor. So what were you, uh, school, you, was that like computer science? 
so I went to school for computer engineering. So if you're not familiar with it, it's a mix between electrical engineering, where you're building and designing hardware, and uh, computer science, where you're just doing software. So computer engineering is kind of the merging of the two mixed in with a little bit of mechanical engineering. So you have to be able to interface between the analog and digital world. And that's really kind of where my core education came from. So I got a bachelor's and a master's degrees in computer engineering when I went through, um, I went through the Rochester Institute of Technology in upstate New York. And so from there, like you started working where? Um, so right out of school, I was, uh, so RIT has a co-op program where you go to school for several months and then you leave and you go on what they call co-op and it's basically a paid internship. So I was working at a company called Clearwire Technologies out in Buffalo, New York for probably about two or three years. Um, and I started out as a co-op and they, I got to the end of uh, college and they said, Hey, we'd like to bring you on. And they offered me, I don't know, it was like $37,000 or so, something like that. And I said, you're kidding me. This is, this is like borderline insulting. Um, actually, I think it was 32,000 now that I, I think about it. But anyway, that was around my salary range when I was hired at a web design agency in Manhattan. And I, I think, I think the equivalent there is like, I was probably getting paid like $10,000 and like, <laughs> Yeah. But anyway, they gave me the, the offer and uh, like my boss could tell I was not terribly pleased with it because I was, uh, you know, you come out of RIT with a computer engineering degree and you're expecting 55 or 60 or something like that. But they, they gave me the offer. My boss could tell I wasn't happy. And uh, I think a day or two later, I said to him, look, I'm going to start looking for something else. And literally within 24 hours, I had another, uh, I had an opportunity to kind of drop in my lap. And the next day I had an interview. A week later, I had a follow-up interview. And the day after that, like I had a, basically had another job offer and making like 20 some thousand dollars more. So it was just, you know, it wasn't going to be a good fit. They just really did not want to pay me more, which I can understand to some extent because I was in the IT department at Clearwire. So I did do some software and hardware design there, but I, I was really maintaining like a lot of the computers for the engineers and they just, they weren't paying IT people very much. And that's kind of where they, where I fit in. So I ended up at a software job. And so you mentioned that you were running some, some businesses on the side. Like what were some of those businesses? So from about 99 to 2004 or 2005, I'd say, I ran a small business called Game Thoughts, which was a video game publishing. So I would either write my own games or find other developers who had games that were essentially shareware at the time and resell them on the internet. So like PC games, basically. Yeah, so mostly downloadable stuff. Um, I did have a game that was uh, it was an online game that similar to like, and obviously like different genre, but like you go on Facebook and there's all these games that you can play like Candy Crush and various million other things. That I did basically the same thing back in 99, 2000 time frame because I was trying to learn some different technologies and I wanted to learn how to write web-based code. So I did all that stuff, like a, a copy of SQL Server that I had. I had my own co-located server back at the time and I was running I had um, around 400 people playing and logging in basically every day just to play this game that I'd built. Um, I didn't charge for that. That was kind of a, uh, I was using that as kind of a marketing ploy to get people to come to the site. And because they came every day, it seemed like it would be helpful. But what really happened was they just wanted to play that game. And even though I was advertising other games that I was reselling for people, they just really weren't interested in it. The click through, like I, I got in some advertising networks, the click through rates were abysmal. Um, I, the ad network actually complained to me and said, your click through rates are way lower than anyone else's. <laughs> And it was just because people liked the game so much. Um, I mean, even now, it's 15 years later. I still, on occasion, get people emailing me, ask me if I'm going to bring that game back. Wow. I'm like, nope, I'm not going <laughs> to do it. <laughs> the hardcore fans, they're sticking with it. Yeah. Okay, so... Uh, so that was just kind of like a side income, but but you were like reselling games. I, I mean, I'd say all told that probably that business probably only made like fifteen or twenty thousand dollars over the course of several years. Um, there were some games that did really well, and then there were some that did not. It's interesting because that was in the period like you said, like ninety nine to like two thousand four around there. Yep, about that. You know, because you fast forward to like two thousand seven, the iPhone comes out. And then mobile gaming from there just starts to blow up. Console games are continuing to blow up. And like, I like, do you ever think about it? Like if you had stuck in the video game industry through that period or through now? Um, 
I mean, it's not something that comes to mind very much. Um, I feel like it would it still would have been a difficult uphill slog. So with video games, it is very much a hit or miss type of thing. And if you're not the one developing it, it's very difficult to get the developers to kind of you know go along with your vision because you're the one who's doing the marketing for it. You have a handle on what's going to resonate with people. And it's hard to kind of relay that back to them and force the issue, even if you are publishing them or even if you do have a, a contract, because they can always just say, hey, I'm going to walk away, especially if you're not paying them up front. So I didn't have the money to be able to like basically buy the rights. Essentially, what I was doing was I was saying, look, you build this. I'll help out with logistics and everything and support, and I will help distribute it. But it really, at that point, it's more of a uh, they're doing the upfront work and then I'm doing the back end work. And for them, it was, you know, it's kind of like going and being a non-technical co-founder today and going and finding a developer to build your product. Unless you can prove that it's going to work, it's really hard to convince them to spend the next six months to 18 months building something if there's no real guarantee that it's going to go anywhere. Yeah. And for a consumer audience and a gaming audience, it's really hard to like validate that. Yeah. It's very hit driven. I mean, there was one game that came out that it ended up getting slash dotted, but it was more because they looked at the graphics and said, this is terrible. But I mean, it actually ended up getting decent sales because of it, because people wanted to buy it. And now they make games like purposely terrible graphics because it's cool. Right? But uh, I mean, I think about that sometimes like that period, because I, I went to school. I thought I was going to be a music producer and especially composing music for picture, like background composition for tv and film and commercials and i was doing that I, I was actually getting some some of my tracks like placed on television and and some commercials and and like film stuff and some international stuff which was cool i started getting some some royalty checks like a couple hundred bucks here and there but in 2003 or 2000 i guess i i was doing that around i was doing that up until around 2005 or so but that's when i started to be like all right i need to make some money and i veered into the web industry Fast forward a few more years, iPhone comes out, you got all these new opportunities for media that needs music and TV it, these days is like blowing up. We're in this like golden age of television now where it's like, had I stuck with music for, <laughs> for media, like there would have been way more opportunities now than there were 10 years ago, but it's just too hard to get back into it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's sometimes it's wrong place, wrong time, or other times it's just circumstances. I mean, I had I had an open invitation to go interview at Westwood Studios, which made the Command and Conquer Red Alert series. And I, because of the way that things ended with my old employer, what ended up happening was I just I was angry and I just went off and got a new job, and it literally dropped in my lap the next day. So. I didn't even really have time to turn around and go back to Westwood Studios and say, hey, now that I'm graduated, can I come in for an interview? It was just I had a new job already lined up. So I wasn't going to go you know, all the way across the country. I mean, I, even in, when I was younger than that in not quite high school, but like early college, I played Warcraft. So that was kind of a lot of the impetus for me really wanting to get into the gaming industry. And at the time, it was like Westwood Studios and Blizzard were like the two massive RTS gaming companies. And there was really nobody else at the time. Um, I could have gone in that direction, but I don't regret it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So you had like the kind of gaming site, reselling some games, doing your own games. What else were you doing on the side, like business wise? Um, I would say that was primarily it. Um, I did have another business with a, a four letter domain name at one point where I was reselling hardware. So uh, at the time, Dell computers were awful and you could make a, you know, judgment calls today one way or the other. But at the time, because I was doing so much IT work, I was seeing like a lot of hard drive failures. The processors just weren't great. You know, like just the machines would fall apart easily and they would crash all the time. They just did not use good hardware. And what I was doing was building computers for people and most people were like interested in gaming computers so that kind of drove the price up and i could build a computer and find all the parts and get the software and everything and i could build a really good computer and then resell it for three or four hundred dollars above what it cost me to build it so i really got good at building computers and picking out hardware and video cards and all the stuff that went with it for several years and that business made pretty good money because it was all on the side while i was in college so can you share the four letter domain name? <laughs> oh, it was a uh, yako.net or yako.net. I don't even know what's up with it at this point. I think there's some domain squatter at this point, but you know, looking back on it, I'm like, ah, I wish I still had that, but whatever. But so you were using that to market your computer building service. Correct. Yep. Yep. Were you like, was it fully online marketing, like selling to strangers over the internet or like 
I, I got a lot of word of mouth referrals because um, I got, ended up getting into the like the world of these people who were like really into flight simulators. So because of flight simulators back then, you really didn't have like the 3D graphics that you have now. And back then you had to have like these daughter board cards and SLI so that like you had two or three different video cards that were working in tandem inside of a, the same computer. So what I would do is I would do the research to figure out which ones work together, which ones you would need for certain flight simulator games and these people talked to one another so i got referred to a bunch of different people because most of them were, i would say were in their you know mid to late 40s to like early 60s and they really liked to play these things because they liked to fly you know they used to do commercial jets and stuff like that and some of them used to fly in the military and they just wanted to be able to play those games and play them online with each other so they needed good graphics to be able to do it so mainly during this period there you were going between like software jobs to consulting doing like software development consulting is that right let's see here 99 to 2001 or so i was still kind of finishing up my degree and then 2001 to 2003 i worked at wegman's food markets and that's the one that you know i jumped ship from clearwire to go work for them for a couple of years which was probably a great move because that was about the time that like the it industry kind of came to a halt um and things just went downhill very quickly in the tech world because of 9 11 and, and to just be in like a business setting not like a crazy startup setting it, that's more secure basically well, it was it was not just more secure, but they hired me to basically build out their online shopping prototype. So I was on a t small team of people that was doing pretty much exclusively web technologies, which kind of ties back to the online game that I built. The reason I got that job was because I'd built this online game that hundreds of people were playing every single day, and they wanted somebody who could come in and knew web technologies and how the internet worked so that they could put me on a project to help them sell groceries online as part of a project. And that was just a prototype project, but it got to the point where like it did really well. It hit all the numbers, did everything it was supposed to do. And the variation between most of like what you hear about, like Webvan, for example, is the billion dollar startup that failed miserably because they spent all their money on infrastructure. Well, Wegmans, what they did instead was you could order your groceries online and then they would go into the store, they'd pick them out and then they'd do that for $7. And then you drive to the store at the time that you pick and you just roll up say, here is my name, and then they charge your credit card in the background, load your groceries into your car, and you walk away. So you don't even have to go shopping yourself. Like They would do it all for you, and it would cost $7. Crazy. So I guess we'll start to like kind of fast forward, but where did you connect with Rob, and uh, like how did you guys initially meet? Yeah, so I moved out to the Boston area in 2003, and then 2003 to 2005, I'd worked for a startup called Pedestal Software, which got acquired by Altiris for like 75 million or so. And then in 2005, I left because of that $75 million, I got $8,000. So do the math. And there's a lot of, you know, there's a decimal place with a lot of zeros and then a one. That's how much I got that in terms of percentage. So I left and started doing consulting and I was looking around online and I, I realized at the time that if I was going to make any money, then I really kind of needed to be the founder of the business because at Pedestal, I was the fourth engineer that was hired. So if I made that much as the fourth engineer, there was no way I was going to make any kind of good money unless I was the founder. So I was looking around for people who were doing the same types of things that I wanted to be doing. And obviously, most of the things that most of the people that you come across in that time frame, it's like Joel Spolsky is kind of leading the charge at that point with Fog Creek. So I followed his blog quite a bit and I was looking around for other ones. And one of them that I stumbled on was um, softwarebyrob.com. And, you know, of course, the one thing leads to another. He's selling a product from his website. He's like, I acquired this and I can't make it work. I'm looking to sell it. If anyone's interested, let me know. And I looked at it and said, well, hey, I want to buy that. And at the time, I was reading his blog, but I didn't realize it, but he was reading mine. So that's kind of how we connected. And then after that, it was probably a couple of two or three years later when we both kind of went our separate ways, met for coffee like literally once. And then a few years later, it was like 2008 or 2009, he was building this thing called the Micropreneur Academy. And what essentially it was, was this online teaching academy, t helping to teach people how to sell and market their software. And uh, he looked around at his uh, short list because he, he looked at the business and how much work and effort he was putting into it and realized he needed help. And uh, I ended up on his short list. We worked out a deal and I basically bought into the business at that point and we busted our tails for like the next 18 months building out this massive course curriculum that you could go through and it was a I think it was a fifty dollars a month forty seven dollars a month and you know kind of grew the subscribership so that was two thousand nine. 
I think, 2009, 2010, something like that. Wait, so just so so did you buy one of his early businesses? Yeah, um, it was called, oh, it was called, I think the domain was called clicksess.com and it was, there was forum software and then there was also a piece of software that could translate SQL Server stored procedures into ASP code that you could then plug into your own application. So you'd write the stored procedure, you'd point the software at it, and then it would build and generate all the stuff behind it so you could use it in an ASP application. And both of those, like I knew the ASP application side very well because that was the technology that I'd written my online game in back in 2000, 2001. And I knew how tedious and time consuming it was to do all that stuff. Yeah, so it's kind of like a developer tool sold to developers. How did that go for you? Um, it didn't really go anywhere. And I knew this when I acquired it, but like that particular product, it had some missing source code. And like some of the files were messed up and uh, it didn't quite compile. And even when I got it to compile, I knew that there were files missing. And he had told me that up front. He wasn't, he didn't shy away from that. So that didn't really go anywhere. And then the forum software, there's so much forum software out there that it's hard to make, or at least it was hard for me to make a business out of it because I was essentially so far behind the curve. And if you don't have money, you're probably going to go for like V Bulletin or any of these, you know, PHP. And even like back then, forum software was almost more popular then than it was now even though there, there are popular forums now like back then there were not social networks so it, it was like it was the forum like that was the social network right and i acquired it from him back in i think 2006 so it was right around the time that facebook was coming out becoming more widely used so like as facebook grew in popularity i looked at that and i said yeah this business is not going to go anywhere and it's going to be really hard for me to compete and i just kind of walked away from it um i still had it and screwed around with it here and there but so i i didn't really about micropreneur academy i actually didn't realize that that came before the podcast yeah so that started uh, so he and i talked about it in 2008 and then like uh early 2009 or so was when we really started hammering on it and then it was in late 2009 we decided look how can we market this a little bit better so we'd done a podcast tour to help promote it and then we ended up saying well if we had our own podcast we could kind of talk about it there and advertise it so in 2010 uh, that's when we created the podcast got it so the starters for the rest of us was literally the marketing tool for um, like one of my questions I was going to ask you was like, when did the podcast and everything kind of start to take off? And like, when did you kind of decide to turn it into a business? But I guess what happened was it started as the business and then you use the podcast to then grow the audience. Right. And then by the end of 2010, we got to the point where our Micropreneur Academy community was large enough and our podcast listenership was getting high enough that we said, wouldn't it be awesome to get these people together in a room and hang out with them? And that's kind of how MicroConf came around in 2011. So there's this progression, which like 2009 started the Micropreneur Academy, 2010 started the podcast, and then 2011 started MicroConf. And if you look at them in terms of how they should have been ordered. Most of the time, I think you'd start with like the free product, the lead in, like the podcast, and then you'd go to like this small subscription for the, the monthly subscription for the community. And then you'd have like the giant big ticket item, microconf kind of at the end. And that's not the order that we did. I feel like everybody goes through that progression at some point. Like you start with a big product, you know, you, you learn a bunch of stuff and then later on you start doing the audience building and then start again. But I don't want to gloss over this because like I'm trying to understand like how did the podcast and the audience that you guys built and the early customer base for Micropreneur Academy, how did you get that? How did you get all that traction? Like, did it all happen within the first 12, 18 months there in like 2009, 2010? I would say it was a little bit before that. And most of it was a result of Rob's blog at the time, because he was doing a lot of uh, guest posting and uh, posting a lot on his blog. And a lot of his readers looked at that. And when he announced that he was going to be starting this uh, Micropreneur Academy for people who wanted to build their own business and do things kind of like he was. And you know, it, was, it wasn't necessarily him putting them out there as like, hey, I'm an expert in this and I can teach you. It was more of a, I want other people to network with who are doing the same types of things that I am. And I'm more than happy to create a uh, course curriculum for you that will go with it. But I really want a community here that people who are doing this kind of thing can leverage and be part of and have somebody to talk to and communicate with. So like Ruben Gomez, for example, was one of like the charter members of it. And there's like a handful of probably, it's probably like a hundred or so that he started with. 
that we're each paying around fifty dollars a month for it to start off with, and that's it. Just grew from there because you know word of mouth and people talking to one another, and then just marketing over time to get more people into it. And then as we did like podcast tours and things like that, it just kind of naturally progressed. Yeah, crazy. Um, and I guess it, it was also like not only have you guys kind of really like led the charge of this whole like self-funded kind of bootstrap software community, which has grown like today, it's it's really thriving with multiple micro comps and everything. But even back then, aside from that being in its infancy, I think just blogging and podcasting in general, like it wasn't the total beginning of that, but it was not nearly as crowded as it is today. Yeah, I, I think there's definitely been a shift over time. So like between 2001 and 2008 or so, I think that there was this big shift towards blogging. Like in 2000, 2001, it was like, oh, nobody's going to do this. Who could possibly want to put their voice out on the internet and have, or, you know, their writing out on the internet? Like who would want to do that? And then, of course, that starts to explode. And at some point, it has kind of transitioned into podcasting, to be honest. And that was, I would say, at the tail end of the 2000s leading up to 2010. And I guess maybe in some ways we got lucky in terms of deciding to do the podcast. But at the same time, we also knew how difficult it was to put a, a blog post out there and have it get any sort of traction. It's very easy to get on a podcast and just talk to somebody about what it is that you're doing. And it resonates more with people versus a blog post. Your writing can be top notch, but you still have to do a lot of marketing and promotion for it. And it's hard. Yeah, it still has to break through the noise. Yeah, yeah. And it, that noise has just grown over time. Yeah. Okay, so the Micropreneur Academy starts to take off and the conferences you guys are doing that like you just start doing microcomps eventually that grows into multiple microcomps every year. Like I'm kind of curious about I don't know how much you're willing to share or whatever, but like how significant of a business is that for like you and, and Rob? Like is that how how do you think about that? Um I mean, it's. I think for me, it's probably more significant than it is for Rob having, you know, because he's still dripping everything to lead pages. So for me, it's probably a, a more substantial revenue stream for me than it is for him. But that said, like I'm, I'm looking at Blue Tick as kind of being the next big thing for me to just to kind of move things forward. But I will say that it's not insubstantial. I mean, you can do like back of the envelope math and say, okay, well, how much does this make? And it's probably not difficult to figure out. I mean, MicroConf in Vegas. I think we had about 425 attendees. So you just start doing the math on the 250 that came at $800 each and then the 175 that came at six or $700 each. And then in, in Europe, we've got around 150 or so that pay around seven or 800. And yeah, it gets messy because then you've got euros and conversions and everything. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I know that there's a lot of speculation around like how profitable can a conference actually be? And I know when you're new at it, it, it can be unprofitable. Uh, but I'm just curious between the Micropreneur Academy and, and the microconf. Like, is it like far and away microconf is what generates most of the income there, or is it the other way, or how does that? It's it's changed over time. Early on, uh, so the first microconf, I think we made seven or eight thousand dollars total. And that was more because we had two sponsors come in at the last minute that uh, like we were going to lose money on the conference. Um, and it was about two weeks before and Rob was more than a little bit stressed out about it. But I had these two sponsors I was working with and I was pretty sure they were going to come in, but I didn't know for sure. And uh, it was about two weeks before we had the conversation and it's like, hey, I've got these two sponsors. They both signed up. It's Microsoft and Redgate. And it ended up putting us from several thousand dollars in the red to like plus five or plus eight or something like that. It wasn't it wasn't a huge amount of money. But since then, I mean, the conference has grown because the first microconf that we held from announcement to actually holding it was literally 10 weeks long. So there was not a lot of time to put the whole thing together and to get people there and sell tickets and everything else. And we still managed to get about 110 people there. And that kind of told us that there was probably something there. And then the next year, things were substantially easier because we really hit a nerve that for a market that just really wasn't being served at all. I think that you could probably come up with a like a I'll say similar but different form of microconf today aimed at bootstrappers and if you have any sort of an audience or a following you could probably make a decent conference out of it but there's there's obviously a lot of things that go into making a conference good and we are really conscious of the type of conference that we would want to go to. It's not about the money. And we never make decisions based on how much is it going to cost. It's what's best for the audience. And that that single factor alone is probably what's made MicroConf how successful it is. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I also think that just the fact that you've actually been able to keep ticket costs down 
while also keeping the quality so high, ticket costs down, keeping a cap on the total number of attendees in the room or at the conference. Um, I know that those are really difficult things to control, especially in, in this sort of industry where most conferences are well over $1,000 a ticket, not including hotels and flight. It really makes it accessible for the folks who are bootstrapping and doing something on the side and trying to get something off the ground. So yeah, that, that's just been amazing. Yeah. And I mean, to to that point, like we made a conscious effort to make our decisions. As I said, it's we try to not make them based on money. And like we want to make it a conference that we would go to. If the conference was twelve hundred, fifteen hundred dollars or, you know, twenty five hundred dollars, it makes it more difficult to justify going, especially if you have to pay for a flight and hotel and everything else on top of it. So it was like for somebody in our position, we wanted to put a conference together for people who were like us. And that's why that, you know, the 500 to $700 price range that we kind of started out at is where it needed to be to make it successful. It's high enough that it filters out the people who aren't serious, but it's low enough for the, like the average entrepreneur who's doing something, even if they're doing it on the side, they can probably still justify attending. And then over time, like as the conference itself grows, we split the conference and we were able to price tier at that point. Yeah. And I I thought that was a great move. It just makes so much more sense to have the starter edition and the growth edition. Yeah. Awesome. So I I don't want to spend a ton of time on this piece, but I think it's important, you know, just to talk about Audit Shark for a bit. Uh, So how do you think about Audit Shark as a product and like that whole period of working on that? Like now that you're pretty far removed from that project, like how do you think about that now? Um, I think of it as a, uh, uh, maybe we'll back up just a real brief moment, just so that in case somebody's not familiar with it. So I spent from around 2011 or so to 2015 building a product called Audit Shark that was aimed at the enterprise market for security. So the intent behind the software is it will go out to a machine and pull back configuration settings and validate that it is configured the way that it's supposed to be configured, whatever that happens to be. So you have these templates that you apply and it'll say out of 200 items, for example, or 200 checks, you know, 195 of them are correct and these five are wrong for whatever reason. So then they need to go get fixed. And that was kind of selling into enterprise, selling into IT directors or IT departments at, in large organizations? Yeah. So it, that's the general market that it was aimed at. Um, IT directors probably is a good example. Um, anyone who's in a regulated industry. So finance, healthcare, uh, healthcare was a really big one. So in this product, I built it as essentially a replacement for the product that I helped build at Pedestal Software, which, as I said, sold for $75 million. So it makes it, in my mind, it made it easy to say, hey, there's a lot of money that, to be made there, and it's going to you know, hopefully put some of it in my pocket. Of course, there's caveats there, and clearly it did not work out in my favor, but there's a bunch of different reasons I can point to for that. Um, how do I look at it back now? I would say I look at it as a learning experience that says if you are not comfortable selling a piece of software in the way that most people are comfortable buying it, you're not going to be able to change the world. You're not going to be able to get them to change how they currently do business in order to fit your model unless you're a funded company. And I didn't have the money or the resources to be able to make that change in the market. And I mean, you're boiling the ocean at that point. And in retrospect, that makes complete sense. But I didn't want to like have sales reps. I didn't want to have like go on site and do demos and things like that. Um, I didn't want to have resellers. All of those things, like those are all done in the enterprise market and I didn't want to do them. So of course it's not going to be successful. Yeah, that's interesting. It's like you did identify a market and a need and a high value solution, but yeah. I, and you know, I, I definitely relate to that with my years working on restaurant engine because I, I kinda <laughs> I kind of reached the same conclusion at a certain point, except I wasn't selling to enterprise, I was selling to local restaurants at a much lower price point. (laughs) Uh, But for me, I came to a point where I'm going to do all the online marketing that I was able to do with that, with the limited budget that I had to really take it to the next level. I'd have to go fly out to the restaurant industry conference and start walking into restaurants and talking to restaurant owners and get into that whole world. And I was like, that's not the way that I want to be selling this sort of product. Yeah. And because I shied away from those types of things and was trying to find other ways to make it work, the reason that large companies sell software that way is because it works. <laughs> and they don't necessarily care about like, you know, how they feel about that particular business model. The fact is that it makes them money and they are not the ones who literally have to be the feet on the ground. They hire sales reps to go do that. And I wasn't in a position to be able to do that. So I think now it's called like, you know, founder product fit. 
or something like that. So yeah, it's like, are you a good fit for selling your own product? And, and for that particular one, I was, I was definitely not. I was good for building it. Um, it did some very, very complicated things. But I, I, if I had a team, if it was funded, it'd be different because then I wouldn't necessarily have to deal with those sides of things. But um, I didn't want to go that route either. So yeah, it's not enough to just validate the product and the product market fit. It's like equally, maybe even more you have to validate is, is the right fit for you. So, okay, so we're moving into Blue Tick, and this takes us into what, like 2015, 2016? Yeah, I'd say 2015. So, before we get into the product itself or the way that the idea came about, coming out of the decision to kind of shut down Audit Shark and you know that you're going to move into something new, what were you thinking in terms of like, all right, my next thing has to check these boxes? Like, was there any kind of conversation in your mind about that? Yeah. So I wanted it to be something that I would personally use or had a particular problem solving and a bunch of different problems I'd had when trying to work with Audit Shark and sell it to people. But I wanted it to kind of fit that profile so that it would be something that I would use on a regular basis, which would make it easier for me to develop it and understand what the challenges associated with that particular problem or market were. Something else was that was a consideration was I wanted it to be something that was SaaS based just because the, the SaaS business model and recurring revenue and everything that goes with that. And I also wanted it to be a, a low enough price point that somebody could get in and start using it and paying for it without having to go through like a lot of hassles of, oh, I need to get 25 different people to sign off on this. So I really kind of eliminated like consumer market, enterprise market at that point as really like small, medium businesses and freelancers who could justify paying for something. Um, the other consideration that I was looking for was I didn't want it to be a really low price point. So nothing below like $25 a month. Um, I was hoping for at least 50, if I could get it like higher than that, you know, in which of course you can with price tiering. That's kind of what I was aiming for. I also didn't want it to be so overly complicated that it couldn't be launched in a semi reasonable time frame. Where you think about audience it has to kind of fit your, like the people who you're already in touch with. You know, I, that did f- could like come in as a factor, uh, but it wasn't like the determining factor. Like it, I didn't say like if it's not people already in my audience, I'm not going to do it. You know, so like that would be preferable, but it's not necessarily like the only thing. And especially since I heard from like you know Jason Cohen at Smart Bear where he built WP Engine and he said that like he had a mailing list of ten or fifteen thousand people and he emailed them about WP Engine and he got like three or four signups. So I knew that. If I were to try and build something that relied heavily on my audience, it was probably not going to work. Like if he can't make it work, there's no way I'm going to make it work because he's way better at it than I am. So I didn't want that to be like the definitive factor. I said, well, what are all the different things that can kind of go into it? And is that lead me in the right direction? Interesting. So, you know, you're looking for a business that meets that criteria. How did the blue tick start? And like, were there other ideas that you were kind of like weighing up and down? Yeah, so there were actually two ideas that came to mind. One of them was Blue Tick, and then the other one was something called ETL Studio that I created. ETL Studio is a kind of a play on extract, transform, load. It's the basic idea of extracting data from one source, translating it, and then sending it off to another source. So you can think about that. A very simplistic example would be take a file that's a CSV file, extract it from the disk and send it into a database. Like that's a very simplistic example. It's very clear and understandable. Um, I looked around at that particular market and the idea of loading data into a database, there's a bunch of different tools out there and they all fall between the, like the 20 to $500 range. There's some that go up into the couple thousand dollar range, but not very many. I think there's one or two that are up in that range and they're really aimed at like enterprise companies. So what I was looking for was, I was like, well, this will probably be like a downloadable product, but let's give it a try. And like, if the price point is there and I can get the traffic for it, then it doesn't matter. Because I was really just looking at like, would this be a re- viable revenue stream? And after about a month and a half or so of trying to get in front of those people and have conversations with them, I realized that as much as I wanted that idea to work, it didn't matter because I couldn't find enough of those people to even have conversations with, let alone like actually try to sell them something. So I kind of abandoned that because I just couldn't get enough people to talk to. Had I gone the direction of let me like, hey, this is a problem. I know that it can be solved with code. And then I spent the next six months to a year building it. I would have launched a crickets because I would not have been able to find those people to even sell it to. So that validation process that I went through in advance really helped me figure out like this idea is not going to work. 
And it sounds like at this point, and also as you got into validating blue tick, you become this is not your first rodeo. So it's like you're smarter to be able to move quicker through ideas and put them away and, and move on. So blue tick, I actually remember you showed us a really preliminary like video concept for it at, at Big Snow Tiny Conf. I guess that was 2015, which is pretty cool. And I think you were presenting it as like, yeah, this is just something I'm kind of kicking around. I'll probably never do this, uh, but just going to throw it out here anyway and, and see what you think. And it was pretty interesting. Um, I'm sure you're like me where I have like some idea that, I'm, oh, yeah, I'm never going to touch this thing. Like, But really, I'm thinking like, all right, I'm probably going to do this business at some point. <laughs> like, were you thinking that pretty early on? Um, well, the thing is, by the time I'd gotten to the point where I broke code on it, I already had over a dozen people who had prepaid me for it. So what the basic process I went through was that I made these mock-ups of what the application would look like. And I guess to step back before that, even after I'd validated that ETL Studio was not going to fly, what I did was I said, okay, well, I've got this other problem that I experienced back in like 2000, 2013 or 2012. Like, and I've kind of had this ongoing problem where I'm trying to follow up with sponsors, for example, for MicroConf, because I'm in charge of that. So I need to talk to them, send them an email. If they don't respond, I have to send them another email and follow up with them. So it's like blue tech really fits into that particular sales model really, really well. So it was a problem I was intimately familiar with about like you send somebody an email, then you send the second email is like you have this template, you have to copy it over and reply to the previous email. And then the third email, you do the same thing. And it's just like once you get up to five or 10 or 15 of these conversations in parallel, it's really difficult to keep track of them. And even just the copy pasting is tedious. So you just really don't want to do it. But the process itself works really well. You know, I mean, you look at the list of sponsors for MicroConf this past year, and it'll show you, like, we had more sponsors this past year for MicroConf. And I can tell you, without a doubt, like, part of that is because of BlueTick and because it works. So you had this concept. I remember you had, like, really, pl- like, an explainer video, basically, that you put together. Like, how did you go about getting that first group of prepaid customers? Like, who did you even present it to? First, what I did was I set up a landing page and I ran some paid ads for it, basically through Twitter, their lead cards at the time that, that they don't offer anymore. Uh, so I did a little bit of that, got some conversations going. And uh, what I very quickly found was that the number of conversations that I got was far above and beyond what I was getting for ETL Studio. Like it was night and day. And then when I was talking to people, once I got to the point where they understood what it was that I was talking about, then it immediately resonated with them. And they could also think of other people that also had a similar problem. And when I asked them, is there anyone else you know who has this problem? They would say yes. And they were happy to do introductions. Um, So I would say at least a third to probably about half of the people that I talked to were people that I didn't necessarily know before I started you know, asking around inside of my own personal network and saying, hey, is this a problem that you have? So I went to businesses that I thought would have this problem. And I did the same thing with ETL Studio, but they didn't really have that problem. It was hard for me to judge externally, like, is this a problem you have? Yes or no? No, 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 no. With BlueTick, I had a lot, a much easier time of doing that. So when I go to somebody, drop them a cold email and they'd respond, like it resonated with them. And because I would ask for referrals with pretty much everyone I asked to ask to have a demo with, it expanded my reach even further. So I was able to get those. You and I have talked about this process of launching Blue Tick multiple times throughout this process, like hanging out at, at the conferences and everything. And like, I actually never picked up on that one detail that you just said about asking for the referral. Like, I haven't been doing that, and I and I should have been doing it. Yeah, like I I had a similar like pre beta group for Ops Calendar, and they pre paid as well. But I didn't explicitly ask each and every one of them, like, is there one or two people who you think might also fit into this group? And uh, and that would have been really helpful. Ask for three, and then they don't feel so bad when they only give you one. And if you think about it from a number standpoint, if let's say that you have 12 people to talk to, if each one of them gives you one referral, you've instantly doubled the size of the audience of the people available that you're going to talk to. If each of them gives you two or half of them give you two and the other half give you zero, you still doubled the size of like your reach. So asking for those referrals, even if somebody says, no, I can't use this. Uh, and I had several people who's like, yeah, I can't use this. It's like you could still kind of salvage something out of it. Exactly. Because um, some of them were like consultants or they would uh, they had like teaching academies or something similar like that. And they couldn't use it, but there were people inside of their audience who could. And there were people who actually recommended it to their audience. I've had uh, emails go out where I've 
giving a demo to somebody, they say, yeah, I can't really use this right now, or I could have used it six months ago, but now I'm in a different business. But their audience can use it and they'll put it in like a newsletter, for example. And those referrals, that word of mouth stuff, people have asked me a lot about how I've kind of grown Blue Tick so far. And it's honestly, it's word of mouth. Like I'm asking people for those referrals. I'm asking them like, do you know anyone else? Is And some of it's just blind luck, to be honest. This is great. Yeah. You know, like I feel like you have the Startups for the Rest of Us podcast, which obviously has a huge audience. And you're giving, you know, occasional updates on where, where things are at with Blue Tick, but I feel like you're not really talking about it a whole lot on your podcast and certainly not really going into like the use case for it. I know you've mentioned it a little bit, but like not a whole lot. So like clearly you're getting leads from who are beyond just the podcast audience, you know? Oh, definitely. Most of my demos and stuff like that don't come from my audience. They come from other people's audiences. That's awesome. Okay. So here we are middle of 2017 now we're kind of in the midst of your like official launch, I guess you're considering this, right? Like, can you take us through what is your launch sequence? Like, what have you done so far? Where are you right now? What's coming up in the next few weeks? Yeah, so the product officially launches next Tuesday, so literally a week from today. Um, I've got a bunch of emails that I have kind of lined up to go out this week and next. So I've got one that goes out tomorrow. I've got another one that I have to go back and look at the spreadsheet to see exactly you know details on some of that. I think one goes out on Friday. And then another one, it's either Sunday or Monday, I can't remember which, and then uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday to basically kind of get that launch sequence going. And then there's, uh, I think, Friday, because I'll be basically be doing like this uh, 72-hour-ish time frame for like the launch. So... And each of those emails is uh, really designed to either get somebody to either commit or kind of back off and like opt out and say, yeah, I'm just not interested. So my email list is probably about – it's around 1,000 people or so. If I had to guess how many of those were qualified or, or well-qualified, I'd say it's probably 150 to 200. Um, it's not nearly as, as high as like that number seems to imply. And so the quote-unquote launch – is it a launch because there's like a window where you can get like a launch discount or is it just like the incentive to sign up now? So right now, like if you go to the website, you can't sign up unless you go through a demo. And that kind of leads back to the demo process that I talked about where people have to give me their information and then we set up a demo and talk to them. But even to go, like if you go to the pricing page and you click on there to sign up, it'll take you to the page. And if you try to log into the app, it'll say register, and but there's an invitation code. So you can't even get past that first step to create your account unless you have an invitation code that I have to give you. So you literally can't sign up. Yours is way more technical than mine. Mine is like pretty much the same thing. Like it's, you can't access it from the public site, but I don't have a code. It's just like, if you happen to know the page of my signup page, you can sign up basically. I do have it kind of locked down like that, but you know, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. I mean, if somebody were came to me and said, Hey, I have this problem. Can we talk or whatever? I mean, I'm not going to be shy about saying, hey, okay, yeah, here's an invitation code. Let me walk you through and help get you set up. But the goal of the launch is really to get it in the hands of more people. So I've been onboarding people for the past six months or so. So I would say like November of this past year is when I first started taking money for it. And then it was like, I had one customer in November, one in December, two in January, two in February, I think four in March. And then it's just like gone up since then. And I think I'm I'm up to around I think 26 or 27 paying customers right now that are or they're all on like monthly subscriptions. So the MRR for it is around 1100 to 1200 dollars a month right now, and I haven't like I said like next week is the launch. So my hope is that I could push it to like you know 50 or even higher than that in terms of like the launch. Which you think about it, it's like okay well I'm adding 23 customers but I've got 27 right now so if I'm basically doubling the customer size. So I don't think that that's too unreasonable given the size of my email list right now because like i said it's probably 200 to 250 that are kind of qualified but you know we'll see how it goes that's kind of what the purpose of a launch is so once we get past next week then it's like post launch and then it's like really where the rubber hits the road so what's what would you like to see happen i mean what do you actually plan on doing marketing wise and and getting it out there for the next few months of this year yeah, so I feel like there's going to be a lot of competitive marketing that I'm going to be doing because um, one of the things that I really focused on when I was building the product was to, when I would have conversations with them, they would like people would tell me like, oh, I use X for, I use X right now. And that was actually a really good data point because it told me one, that they were already paying for something that solved that particular problem, which it sounds like a very innocuous thing. But if somebody is already paying money for another product that does something and you have any sort of relationship with them and 
they're willing to give you the benefit of the doubt or any sort of trust that you're going to fix the problem in a way that helps make their lives easier. Is there one competitor that keeps coming up or, or just like several? There's a lot. Um, I put together a spreadsheet. There's about 30 competitors that are in this particular you know, market, so to speak. There's probably five to eight that are kind of like, you know, uh, I'll say high, uh, most, most heavily used. Yeah. I mean, with, with Ops Calendar, there's definitely about 10 or so that I was able to find, like competitors doing more or less the same thing, or there's some overlap feature-wise, but there's clearly one. Well, there's like two, two or three if you include like Trello and spreadsheets, but there's one paid SaaS company that just keeps coming up. And like people are finding ops calendar and i'm not even really pushing it at all right now they're finding it because they're actively looking for alternatives yeah and i found that like there's um i'd say there's less than five that come up on a regular basis and of those five there's at least one or two of them where the people that i had those initial discussions with said i don't like this product and here's why um one person i onboarded sent me a 15 minute video about all the things that he hated in the product that he was currently using and told me why he was switching so you get that kind of competitive information and it's really helpful, but I focused really hard on what things they didn't like about those other products and solve them. Because my goal with BlueTick is to kind of get it integrated into your sales process. And once it's integrated into your sales process, you're going to have a really difficult time justifying changing, not because it's difficult to change, but because there's so much risk involved with going with a new product, especially if the current one that you already have is working well enough and and doesn't have the problems of those other ones. Because most of the people I've talked to have switched several times. They've used this, they've used that. There's like four or five things that they've tried already. And I'm like, why did you stop using this? Why did you stop using that? Um, and a lot of it's because like they just didn't work. Like the biggest things that I hear is that the one biggest is that they don't catch the emails. So the system sends out an email, somebody replies, and the software that they're using does not catch the fact that they received a reply and will send the next one anyway. And that's that's a really big red flag. Like you can't have software that maintains this illusion that you're sending the email if it does those types of things. So, I mean, just from an engineering perspective, one of my marketing plans is to build a video that shows you like, hey, here's what some of the competitors do and here's how they're architected. And this is why those things don't work. And this is how BlueTick is architected. And this is why that will never happen and you will never have that problem with the software. And by focusing on those things, like anyone who's experiencing that problem, they start looking for an alternative, they'll come across blue tick and they'll say, I have that problem. How do I know that blue tick is not going to have that? And then they see that video and it's like, they're just, their mind is made up. Yeah. It's like the number one question. It's their number one problem. There's the, it's the number one reason why they're trying to find something else to switch to. And if you can nail that, it makes it a no brainer. Totally. And, and it's becoming so much more competitive, just SaaS in general these days. And I've had the same types of conversations where it's like, asking them like, well, all right, so what do you think about this price point? And I literally hear them out loud saying, like, all right, well, I mean, it makes sense because I can cancel this one and I'm paying that much for that one. And I'll probably cancel that. And there we go. Like it makes sense. Awesome. So that's bluetick.io. Definitely check it out. By the time you hear this, it will have launched, you know, the parties will have ended, but the software goes on. So uh, Mike, it's been an awesome, you know, journey to follow along. And I'm just really excited to see Blue Tick grow in the months and years to come. And yeah, thanks for doing this. No problem. And if anyone's interested in kind of seeing the backstory, like behind the scenes leading up to the launch, I do have a video series I'm doing for my blog right now where you can go over and for the 21 days before the launch, I'm recording a, a three to actually I say three, I should really say like five to eight minute video that kind of goes over like what the day was like and what my plans are coming up and what sort of problems i'm experiencing and um i'm on day 14 right now so it's uh it's pretty cool so far and you'll learn a thing or two about whiskey while you're at it yes i, I intro each one with a new whiskey love it awesome mike thanks no problem talk to you soon Hey, did you know that you can get all of these show notes and highlights and links for every new episode sent straight to your inbox by going to productizepodcast.com and sign up for the email list? Yep, it's all there. And while you're at it, a five-star review on iTunes always helps the show find more listeners just like you and me. Okay, that does it for today. Late, 